All yeah. right. Hi. All right. Nice to see you again. I'll I'll tell you, I was uh I was I watched the film several times, the last one, and I just picked up the uh I think it was a donkey saying fuck. It was it was so brilliant. You know what part I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, of course I do. Oh. Yeah, that's the, yeah, the most uh, favorite word in Irish language. And... It, it's it's you know same here and and at least among my uh, small circle of uh, friends it's very popular. What uh, man? So how have you been? First of all, we'll we'll start in a second. Everything uh, good out in England? Yeah, pretty good. Um, um, yeah, looking forward to a haircut. Um, haven't had one since lockdown. So I think you should go for it. Let it keep growing. Or do you want to get a cut? I don't know. Uh, well, I, cut, I said I wouldn't get a cut until I had my second jab. So <laughs> I've got 12, uh, 10 weeks to go. Oh, man. Good, good, <laughs> good. What, one of the things I wanted to ask you, and we'll jump right into it. You know, I, was yeah. listening, I was listening to a couple other interviews uh, with you, and I love the fact, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to have to curse again, but uh, when you said that the first time you met the Pistols, you heard them playing a small faces song and when you approached them what did they what did they call you a middle class cunt i believe <clears throat> yeah that was my um code name <laughs> what one of the things that and i'm going to go back to the joe strummer field uh film that you made which which is uh really one of my favorites and you said something i think you used a soundbite where joe said you know the end of you know by the time that he was able to kind of join in on you know the adult or young adult fun the 60s was pretty much over and that it was like it was like coming to the scene of a battle at the end of it and yeah, everyone yeah. is sort of strewn across the field yeah now what is, what's your story like were you were you at least you were a few years older than all these young uh angry kids that you were filming were you, were you able to enjoy some of the 60s uh well i was joe summer's age actually born in the same year as joe um yeah i enjoyed it man the kinks particularly i you know i i got smuggled in underneath some guy's great coat to see the kinks in the middle club in like 65 i must have been 13. uh i saw the stones at royal albert hall in 66 I uh, saw Jimi Hendrix, the first showcase gig. It wasn't a real gig. It was a record company, Track Records, uh, signed him and, you know, started to break him in the UK in 67. And this was um, a gig near where I went to school on Hampstead Heath in a very bizarre place called Country Club behind Belsize Park Tube Station. And basically it was just a shed. There was no stage. Uh, and these people, track records, you know, uh, Lambert, Kit Lambert and um, Stamp's brother. Um, what was his first Chris. name? Chris. Anyway, Chris Stamp had yeah. hired this place. And my friend's brother was was on the door. You know, he, he worked at this club at the weekends. And uh, he got us in. So we were like 14 then. And um, it was this amazing scene because they got the Beatles were there, uh, Clapton was there, the Who were there, and um, Hendrix was playing. And Jimmy Hendrix experience standing on the floor in front of these guys, and he was going right up to Clapton, playing with his teeth and playing with his, behind his back, and uh, they were all blown away that he was he was really going for Eric Clapton, which was hilarious. And um, I remember it mainly because um, Kit Lambert, the the co-manager. Um, was going around the crowd looking for young boys with a torch and he made you open your mouth you know I don't know what that was he was checking your teeth to see right, if it was right. safe to see his, his member within <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, you know I remember that and trying to work out what that could all be about um did he come up to yeah. you Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, good. I put in an absolute beginners. There's a guy with these light up glasses through scouting for boys. That was where that's from. Yeah, yeah. Baden Powell. <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine? Anyway, so I, I did enjoy the 60s. I, I had a great time. 
Uh, it, would, it would have been fun just to be a fly on the wall when Kit Lambert, Brian Epstein, let's say Andrew, like just a bunch of like nice little dandy boys going out. Yeah. It, it, they, but I didn't go to public school where Joe was some boarding school locked away. I was in school in London, you know, trying to trying to crash the scene, which wasn't easy because you're too young. Right. But but I, what, I enjoyed it. what was some of the music that was most important to you at the time? The Kinks, man. They were everything to me. Uh, small faces I liked, the Stones I liked, but the Kinks were were uh, something else, really. Um, you know, when I heard you really got me, it was, uh, yeah, it just opened. Um, it was like, you know, a dirty nuclear bomb under the sheets on a transistor radio going off, you know. And um, I never looked back, really, once I heard that. So the, did you have a favorite record? Because by the time, like, what, 72, you have Muswell Hill really releases got, out. You really, got me. you really got me. It was my favorite. But, um, oh, yeah, Waterloo Sunset. Oh, they were all favorites. Lola, 70. Um, I love them all. See My Friend is my favorite now. Well, I mean, you, you, the way you treat, I mean, you treat both of the brothers with such reverence and you've made those great films. Uh, the Dave one always appeals to me because I think Dave appeals to me. Just, I, I, I you know, he's just- He's a nice guy. I'm like yeah. his brother, you know. Well, his brother's more complex, let's put it that way. 100%. But, um, but so, Dave is, yeah. You know, without him, there would be no kinks. Dave Davis. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm i still trying to do my my drama about the two of them, but Ray is so difficult to, you know, he's the great prevaricator. He just won't commit. You know, he's the Hamlet of rock and roll, basically. Anyway, I, I live in hope. I live in hope, too. I, I think that's yeah. great. You know, I think that with... Uh, in one of the documentaries that you made, it just when when Ray would say something, and then you would you would immediately cut to Dave saying like he's just a, he's a he's a he's a problematic guy. Uh, yeah, no, it's rich material. It's great. I mean, the other hero of mine, who I promised I would make a film about, um, is even more difficult because he's been dead really for what is it four hundred years or so anyway christopher marlowe you know i used to drop acid in his room at cambridge and summon him up um <laughs> really spend long sessions talking to christopher marlowe and i did promise him i'd make make a film about him and now I, I, I well i got within a week of it in 2003 you know i don't know if you know about this i was doing a film about marlowe in luxembourg and uh, when there was a big tax credit thing you could get there and there was this weird merchant of venice set so we were going to try and make this set look like london but anyway we built beautiful sets of the rose theater i had tom hardy uh playing marlowe i previously had um killian murphy yeah. uh but it, it, so tom was unknown killian unknown. anyway uh money was there apparently but seven days before shooting they called us up, called me up on the stage and called all the crew and all the workers of building sets and stuff into the pit of this elizabethan theater so it was like the the producers and myself were like the on the stage and, and everyone else was in the pit and they they announced that the film was off that the money had fallen through and you know everyone had to go home so um i'm reigniting it now with um johnny depp um not as christopher marlowe but um as sir walter raleigh but you know doing it with his company and um, and um yeah mike rylance is going to be in it and um yeah it's, it's exciting um finally deliver my promise to christopher marlowe i hope yeah. well i hope too but you know it's it's interesting i'm sure that at the time it was a bit of a heartbreak if it if it just kind of went down the tubes but here you've had what is it 17 years and you've made several films since and i think wouldn't you think that you're going to make a better a better one now i i, I think i will make a better one i, I was i was in you know it was bizarre because you you're you're kind of poleaxed 
by that kind of announcement. Uh, you're like, God, I can't believe it. But I was secretly quite happy because these guys were producing it were dodgy guys and um, hence the money fell out. But they were, but, you know, they were trying to trying to mess with the script. It would have been a nasty shoot. I, I, I just felt relieved. And now I know, I know how to make better films probably as well. So, um, yeah, no, I'd be excited to use some of the techniques so I've, I've explored in these documentaries in a, in a fictional context, you know. Anyway, yeah. Well, no, but that, 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 that leads me to ask you, you know, what, when you went to film school in that time, when, and you were a squatter as well, right? I mean, were you, Yeah. So what- Everyone was. Everyone was planning to squat. What, what, did, what, what kind of films did you want, what did you want to make? Like, who were some of the guys that you, you were following at the time, like filmmakers? Um, my my big heroes were you know people like uh, Vigo and Bunuel and Dushvenko and um, Nick Ray, uh, but you know I, I was excited by Scorsese. Mean Streets was was a big moment for me. Uh, I loved Coppola. Um, I loved you know Jack Nicholson's films, uh, films he was in. Uh, but, but um, yeah, Vigo was was the real inspiration for me. <clears throat> I didn't see films when I was a kid. I don't know if you move, I go on about that sometimes. Um, no, you know, I, I, I didn't have a TV, uh, so music was my my thing because I could secretly listen to popular music. I couldn't see popular visual culture. You know, it's kind of uh, that kind of household. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yours. Fine art. Fine art was okay. The, 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 nothing else, kind of thing. Anyway, um, I mean, I did. I saw a Hard Day's Night because you couldn't avoid that, really. I, I saw. I went with friends, you know, um, to see a movie, but I didn't see. I saw El Cid. I remember seeing El Cid with some friends as well. But when I went to college, I was, you know, I, I knew nothing about movies, um, and I. I went for some reason with some other guys, you know, first week we went to see this film at the Cambridge Arts Cinema Theatre. And it was a, a Goddard film, Le Mepri. And they all loved it, you know, and I was sitting there like, this makes absolute, well, Bridget Bardot lying naked across the scope screen made sense, but nothing else did, you know. Um, and I was, it was like, I didn't understand the grammar of it, the language at all, so back you know four or five times to see it again and try and work out what it would meant and i gradually got to understand it you know it's a great great film um god i was you know someone else i loved um but um isn't that interesting yeah. isn't that neat though that you uh you forced yourself to really learn the the language of of godard cinema whereas all those directors with the exception of nicholas ray you know, we're European and, yeah. and you know, the, the whole Hollywood version of filmmaking, while you do have a lot of great filmmakers and you mentioned like Coppola and Scorsese, but they were just a little bit older than you and being affected by the times. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, the, the, the point I was going to make yeah. about Vigo, Vigo was, um, so I got really excited and, and Cambridge has 25 colleges and they had 24 films societies uh my college didn't have one but 24 film societies meant uh they ordered three 16 mil prints of great films every week each college so they're like 70 well and we started one so they're like 75 films floating around on on film um so we used to screen these films uh, and we did it in the summer on the roof of the college you know and um on a sheet uh and it wasn't a very big space. We had to put the projector right on the edge of the parapet of the college. Mm -hmm. And um, this is King's College, you know, the chapel and stuff. Um, anyway, we, we had the La Talente, the movie, one time. And, um, it, you know, it just blew, blew our minds. Uh, and I was just so into it. I didn't realise that I hadn't spooled the film properly onto the, the, wheel, the reel, you know. Um, 
when the film finished, I looked around and there was no film. It was just a projector going round and round. I was like, oh shit, the film's gone over the edge. <laughs> um, the college is right next to the river, camp. Sort of like a metaphor happening. And the film had gone in the river, right? <clears throat> like 60 mil is a lot of, you know, long, uh, you know, feet footage and, uh, you know, meters and meters of film. Anyway, I was trying to wind it back on the, on the reel and it was like twice the size of distorted <laughs> and swollen up and and it was like a nest of, of wet film you know <laughs> so oh, I, I had to you know and they were expensive these prints so i had to try and get it back on the reel so i spent like two weeks with a hairdryer and jean vigo trying to flatten every dry the frame out so i got really close to the film you know and analyzed it by hairdryer <laughs> um it, which is how I really got into Vigo. Did, did it work? Anyway. Did, did it work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I made a film about Vigo as a result later. Like Marlo, I'm obsessed with him. Oh, man. Um, Why are you obsessed about him? What, 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 what about him that uh, really? Aside from Saint Jean, he's Saint Jean Vigo, isn't he? The saint of independent cinema. Mm -hmm. He did it, did it outside the system with a bunch of friends. And, um, you know, somehow scrabbled the money together, but he was, you know, he was just a rule breaker. He was the first guy to take the camera off the tripod and go handheld. Um, you know, he was that kind of inventive uh, type of filmmaker, really. Um, so, and you know, his films speak for themselves, beautiful. Do, do, you, do, you, do you apply that same you know, ethos to, to the work that, I mean, I, I'm sort of, I know you do, but in what sense, uh, did you start to realize that you could break certain rules? Like I look at, I watch some of your films and imagine uh, really getting harassed by some pain in the ass producer saying, you can't put, you know, broadcast quality interview next to a phone message, you know, throughout the whole film. And, and to me, that's, I think any film student who wants to make films or documentaries, and I don't really consider your film, you know, your films, documentaries because it encompasses so much but was there a chance i mean was there a point where you said no one's gonna give a shit if i if i do it this way well i like the idea of people getting upset by it as well you know um i mean the thing that gave me a huge uh kind of confidence in like pushing it uh was punk you know um and when I did the rock and roll spindle, we did keep serially running out of money. So I was like, well, it's better to shoot it on Super 8 than not shoot it at all. You know, right. we were shooting 35 mil, but, um, uh, and then I thought, well, if I, you know, I, I, there's bits on video. I, and I thought, well, this is punk really smashing all this stuff together is each texture of film has a different kind of, tone voice you know um and it became kind of fascinating to, to to mash it all up like that um i don't know i'm still you know i do remember being completely freaked out when i realized you know you wound a bit of film round and it moved you know and i, I still think it's the most incredible magical thing for some reason um so it, to me it's there to be fucked with you know it's it's a uh, it's so it's so full of possibilities and secrets that it's endless and some you've got to ex, you, you know you've got to push it forward and, and um have fun with it and do things that annoy people but please other people you know it's like it's great medium to to just mess with you know i mean that's so exciting to me to do something you think you haven't done before um or someone hasn't done before maybe other people but uh, i love that you know, aspect of starting a new film, trying and push things further out, you know. And um, I agree with you. I don't see them as documentaries. I, I actually don't watch documentaries. I don't like them very much. Um, I like movies, you know. And, and to me, they're cinema. They're weird, they're weird cinema. They are obviously in a, they, they're in the brackets documentary genre i suppose but um they're not really and um you know i i hate the earnestness of most documentaries you know the, the idea that they're, they're telling you the truth 
what they seem to be saying, this film is a documentary, therefore it's some kind of truth to me is, is complete nonsense really and it's, like, it's austere it's 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 like it's not the one thing that i love of among many that i really like about your films is i'm laughing most of the time because the footage that you're uh it's it's i'm laughing at at, at the inserts and what you do with the animation because much of it is is used for it's funny but then you have these very uh almost apparatic um staged scenes you know i think of you dressed as death in at Canvey Island playing chess with with uh, Wilco and this boy in the Shane film running through the green. And it's really lush and beautiful. So it's aren't you glad that you have uh, feature directing experience with art departments and videos and things like that, that you could actually make these things happen? Yeah, I am. I mean, I you know, I have to say I was I'm, I'm not comfortable um, on a set with a hundred people uh, being told what to do by some financier. <laughs> I have a problem with that, uh, which is probably not a great thing if you want a career making um, <laughs> feature movies. But, um, you know, I just can't handle being told what to do uh, it, when I'm creating. I, I have to just do it, you know, and so, um, the thing of working now, I mean, technology has helped incredibly. You know, I, I work with four or five people and I don't have someone standing behind me saying, I'm going to rip this scene out of the script because you're fucking over schedule, you know, whatever. Um, so, you know, that, that pressure that comes with money, uh, you know, the budget is, is the wrong kind of pressure. I, I think pressure is good, you know, but the pressure should be to, to make a film that blows people away, not to be on some artificial schedule. That means you can't be spontaneous. You know, if you see, you know, I, on absolute beginners, I'd constantly see like the teddy boys playing football in the bomb site, you know, and I'd say, just swing the camera around. Great, the sunlight's fantastic on that rubble and, and the, the AD would say, you can't do that, Cub. You know, we've got to get this shot by 4.15. You know, I was like, Jesus Christ. Oh. Um, so, you know, I, I'd i like to take some of the things I've, I've learned from the freedom that I've had in these films um, into a low budget, you know, fiction universe, really, and um, try and mess around with that again. Well, no, yeah. So, no matter the project, you you consider yourself an anxious individual when you are uh, working. Do you get into a zone? Yeah, I mean, I find filmmaking very traumatic. You know, um, uh, you know, dangerous for your mental health. Usually, I've had very bad experiences making films where I've, uh, you know, just can't sleep and. Um, just making the film 24 hours a day, you know. Uh, so it's it's an ordeal, you know, um, for me to get through a film. I mean, London, modern Babylon, I really, I had a problem because we had so much archive. I, uh, I had so many ways I thought I, I could do it and I couldn't decide on the one that, I, that I'd that i follow. Um, I wouldn't know, I, I, I loved everything in, all of those, I didn't think that there was any uh, superfluous footage that didn't, and even the music. All day yesterday, I kept walking around my my apartment singing uh, the Linton Queasy Johnson, England is a bitch, <laughs> you know, which was, which was in that, it's so much fun. But so let's talk about the Shane film. How does that, how does that come about? Uh, now that you've told me about your, your, uh, Filmmaking neurosis is, do you get excited about something like that when it comes around? Well, I mean, he asked me to do it uh, and I really wasn't sure I wanted to do it because, you know, he's Shane McGowan. He's a difficult motherfucker. And, um, you know, he comes with a big warning. If you get 10, within 10 feet of him, it's, it's a weird space, you know. Uh, <clears throat> but he wouldn't be Shane McGowan in, unless he was difficult um so i was in two minds and i was finishing 
a thing I was doing about Ibiza, so I couldn't start immediately anyway. So I, I kind of forgot about it. But then Johnny Depp called me and said, why don't you do this thing? I'm getting involved. I would like to get involved. And uh, I just thought with Johnny, you know, I had a bit of ammunition, you know, backup. Uh, if the film got out of control or capsized or whatever, which it was very, it did at times almost um, come to that. Another very traumatic film. I'm glad, I, you know, I'm glad I, did it i'm glad it's over i'm glad it's over <laughs> um uh but you know i i was very attracted to the irish anglo-irish dynamic um in his story i like difficult people you know subjects like johnny rotten being one or ray davis being another in different ways there's something challenging about someone who plays this kind of mind games that these guys play uh, and you know there's a reason for the kind of defensive fortress that they've created around them <laughs> they're guarding guarding something quite precious usually that you know they've got hedges full of thorns erected <laughs> um, but in there there's a vulnerable guy with something very special that he's trying to keep some kind of space around uh, i find often and that is the case with Shane too. You know, he's a very, very interesting guy, and, and his songs, um, you know, don't come from nowhere. They come from his experience and his version of himself that he's created, or versions of himself he's created, you know, over time. So he's a fascinating subject, but difficult. You know, first thing he said, "I'm not doing any fucking interviews." Um, you know, just go away and make the film. I don't want to be part of it. <laughs> okay, great. Um, which, you know, I think difficult people make you throw up so many problems that you have to come up with ingenious solutions around them. You have to get around, you know, the hedge. You call Johnny. What? You call Johnny. So we need an interview. Yeah, so yeah, we won't do an interview. Let's see if he'll do a conversation. Right. Which again, you know, sets up other, uh, you know, the first day Johnny didn't turn up, second day Shane, and we're sitting there in France, you know, didn't turn up. And uh, third day they both turned up and the drinks were there and the lights were lit. And uh, they talked for eight hours straight, you know, at six. In the morning, the crew said, I've got to go to bed, you know, or the crew, four or five guys, girls. Um, so, yeah, OK, we stopped. And they've been talking for eight hours, mainly about Jerry Lee Lewis. And for some reason, Chris Christopherson. And I was thinking, Jesus, it's about shaming out. I don't know about Chris Christopherson or so Johnny. And I told him to swing the conversation to, like, some usable bits, but it was just drifting everywhere. <laughs> it's like, so in the end, after that, eight hours or two days and nights and then eight hours um i only got about four minutes out of it that i could use you know so but um you know the key to making a more interesting film was in there not in what they said but i was looking at this stuff because we'd had three, three days to light it it was actually a very beautiful atmosphere it was in johnny depp's bar in his house in France that we just kind of dressed to be an Irish, but dark. And I was looking at Shane and thinking, wow, he looks so great, so, you know, interesting when he's listening to Johnny, not when he's talking. You know. Well, the bits when he was talking was good, but there's only three minutes of them. But there was eight hours of him listening. <laughs> so I thought, God, I've got to use that, you know, and I thought maybe, maybe I could, you know, because normally you throw that shit away, someone listening to someone else talking. I was looking like seeing into his soul through these weird. And there was a spark. I saw it in his eyes in those scenes that there's almost a lovely kind of, aside from the fact when he, when he barks at, at, at one of your crew to turn on some Northern soul or, or Motown music, yeah, yeah. but, yeah. but there was, there's a really like, even when he, he says, he says something of such genuine affection to, to Johnny at some point. And it's it's just it's just a, it's a nice scene to have in there. It's just nice to know that he's alive and and hopefully yeah, yeah. enjoy the film. 
But in terms of pushing the envelope, normally you throw that stuff away. It's it's the rubbish, you know. And when they're talking, you shoot, you show them talking, or show them talking over something else. You don't show endless shots of them listening, right? You just don't do it. But I realised I could make this film around him listening, because he hadn't given us any interviews, but I had gone out to all the journalists who might have interviewed him and say, have you got any micro cassette of Shane McGowan in 1985 in Helsinki, five in the morning, you know? And some of them had kept these tapes where they were with Shane in some bar at the time when he was really firing on all cylinders and it's no, there's no, you know, if you sit him down in front of a big camera, you're just gonna get one kind of controlled version of what he, he wants to project. These were all completely spontaneous, random, felt you were over listening, eavesdropping, you know, very close to the truth, but very different numbers of different truths, different versions of the same story. And all they had in common was terrible sound quality. So I thought, fuck it, if I put a, a micro cassette on the table, I can cut him listening to Johnny as though he's listening to these fragments. Right of him you know and that was the breakthrough moment for me because i was like how am i going to do this film without any fucking interviews you know uh, which is a silly thing to to worry about really but um uh, so i love that the chance of that uh coming because you never sit down and write that you know um that's so, that's really interesting because you know, i did i on until you just what do they call it a spoiler until you said that i thought that they were listening to some of those interviews that, well, uh, I could, we you know, we worked through these eight hours of Shane listening and found moments where it really did feel like existing yes. this particular thing. It was quite an involved process, but it was exciting because you know people haven't done that before. Um, and Shane being difficult pushed us into that. You know, if he'd been easy, we'd have just stuck him in front of a camera, probably. Um, I don't know. I hope not. Probably. When you make a film, when you, especially about, because, the, uh, the, the the ones the films about individuals like Joe or the or or Shane or, or Wilco, how important you know, do do you say I want to I want to get, get the essence of these people? It's not just a, because it's not a rockumentary. It's not like one of those bullshit kind of like when we return we're going to talk about uh, Shane's drug use. Like no, no. no I hate that. Like what, yeah, what are no, some of the things? Is there a checklist in your brain? No. No, but the, the idea of, you know, capturing the contradictions that make people great, you know, no one's perfect. And, and you know, the rockumentary notion that this great rock star needs to be treated with utmost respect and, and worshipful reverence. I mean, to me, that is, you know, death warmed up. It's horrible, horrible. Um, so in some ways, my films are kind of taking the piss out of that idea or, you know, subverting that idea. Um, but, yeah, I like, you know, with with Shane. I, I try and do, you know, I try and find something in the in the process that I don't like sitting down and saying, this is how I'm going to do it. I like kind of getting into it and then f finding something from the process that is unique to making that film about that person, you know? Um, and they're certainly not, you know, they're more about, they're not about music, they're about the world that that music came from and where that person came from, why they made that music, and why people like that music um, as an audience. Uh, and, they're, and they're mainly for young people to learn about their past more, you know? But at the same time, I, I love that you used, um the one because you didn't really interview people from the band and that's fine but i like that you used the philip they Chevron. Oh, are you right they they we asked them but they didn't want to talk with shane be in the same room oh really yeah. did, you get, did you get the bug yeah i did oh brilliant no what i was going to say i like that you used the philip chevron quote about uh being uh you know this this music could have only happened in the diaspora the irish diaspora and then, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you feel the pogues in there. I, again, I think it is a better film for them saying um, they didn't want to be in it because it gave me more time to explore who Shane is. You know, if I'd cut to 
all these talking heads of other band members, there's about eight pogues in there or something crazy. Um, you know, you'd be chopping all over and these people are not as interesting as Shane, you know. So, uh, I mean, Shane, the pogues is Shane McGowan, really. The others make it sound good, but um, you watch him on stage, you know, it's like, you've got to watch that cigarette and that. <laughs> Yeah, it's totally fascinating. You'd mentioned your your fascination with the Anglo-Irish uh, thing. Was you, do you have any Irish in your family? Any of either side? No, unfortunately not. I wish I did. I have Scottish, but I don't have Irish. Um, but I'd love, I'd love to be able to say I did, and then I'd get an Irish passport. You know, um, right. Be great. No, but Brexit. growing up when you did there. there what was your what are your memories of that time you know with with uh, the ira in, in in london and the public perception of irish people just to better understand where shane was coming from because he kind of grew up you know out of ireland but in the midst of that because he felt very irish still yeah well i mean it was a major major thing at the time i had a band called the bombers actually when i was at school in honor of the ira oh, really? that was a that was in 68, yeah. Really? Um, before punk, <laughs> punk name. Uh, yeah, and you know, it was everywhere, the Irish. And, um, you know, when we went to film school, that national film school, there was a, there was a kind of mini bus um, that would pick you up from a, a bench in Holland Park in Planet Squat. You'd walk to this bench, sit and wait for this, bus to sound like a little minibus and I remember sitting there on this bench and this huge fucking explosion and I looked around and there was a Jaguar car about 50 feet in the air behind us you know You're and, um, wow. and then sirens immediately whizzing around and then we were trying to get out around the back route and uh, suddenly these police cars in the little lanes behind Holland Park skidded in front of us and they jumped out and started kicking in the windscreen thinking we were the guys who planted bomb you know um, and we were just trying to get out of it to go to film school but i saw the uh the attitude of the british police if you possibly had planted a bomb somewhere it's like out the hell um and also i you know i i i did the undertone i filmed with the undertones in Derry uh, in the height of the troubles and, and you know, I had British soldiers with machine guns at my head. And, you know, I, so it's, you know, it's, it's that nice thing for me to do something you're not meant, you know, at school, they don't teach you anything about Ang England and Ireland, you know, it's a, like it never happened, you know, and because it's too nasty, it took the story, they don't want to, they don't want to go there. So the idea of, I can go there with Shane you know, was great. <clears throat> were, were you BBC, were you in? BBC, where, did you film in Tipperary? Yeah, yeah. All that stuff with him as a little kid, you know, oh. the young kid. That's all of his actual house. That's that's where he his wow. his mother's family came from, and it hasn't changed. You know, that house is very rare in Ireland to find a little farmhouse that hasn't changed. I, as soon as you said that, I was thinking about the segment where that he's talking to the ducks or the geese. Yeah, yeah. The, the geese are speaking uh, pearls of Irish literature. Fact, I didn't. I don't know if you picked up on that. I didn't. So they're speaking. They're speaking they're, they're in Irish. Quote, well, they're quoting Flann O'Brien and James <laughs> Joyce and stuff, talking to them. <laughs> that I, 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 it's queued up. I'm going to have to go back and watch it. But what? When you make a film uh, like this, do you feel a certain burden to the uh, to the um, to the quote unquote subject? I know that people don't call them subjects anymore, but do you obviously you want them to sign off on it? You know, did did you get a response after they watched this? He hasn't spoken to me uh, since um, <laughs> we, we were waiting for three days in Tipperary with a big film crew to because we filmed all that. It's kind of semi-dramatic stuff with the kid. Um, but he was supposed to come in into this old house where he spent time as a kid. Um, he thinks he grew up there. You know, it's one version of himself grew up, grew up totally on that farm, you know. Um, but um, 
every day we were like calling Dublin and saying, is he coming? And they, no, no. And on the third day they said, he's, 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 he's walking, he's, we're not walking. We're taking him to the car now. We're taking him to the car. And then we got a call back. He didn't get in the car. <laughs> and then on the fourth day, it's a call. He's in the car. We're on our way. We're all like, hallelujah, hallelujah. And he gets to the nearest town from where he grew up or, or lived or spent the summer holiday um, called Nina. And um, he stops there and get, we get a call saying, Shane's in a bar in Nina. He wants you to come there, you know. I'm saying, why doesn't he come to the bloody set where we, were, we you know, agreed? Mm -hmm. No, he, he won't do that. He's coming. He wants to talk to you first. <sighs> So we go there, and about that time, all the people he knew from the town were all knocking back the drinks with him, and it was like, fuck off, you know, I'm not doing it, I've changed my mind. <laughs> he came, he was within five miles, oh, and still wouldn't do it. Um, so, you know, there, there were a lot of regions to, to hate the guy, because not just, he wasn't insulting to me particularly, but making a whole film crew wait and spend all the money that people have put up for the money it's just a very bad way of treating people and his wife was in tears it was a bad scene and um well i felt bad for the nice i don't know if that was the ad or the the dp the, the no, just, yeah it was a, it was an assistant um uh yeah not well a kind of ad yeah um so you know, I, I felt I had, you know, I wouldn't have done the film without wanting to celebrate Shane McGowan. Right. You know, I, I'm not into doing films to put people down. I, I just wouldn't do that. So there was a real reason for me wanting to get immersed in the man who made these songs and someone I respect hugely on a lot of levels. Um, and, um, and, and explore the real amazing contradictions of, of what life has, thrown up for him um, um you know there were times i wanted to walk off i just i couldn't handle that being treated like that and i i also couldn't you know scream at him back because i didn't want him to collapse the film by then you right. know I was, I, so i had to take a lot of shit without doing what i would normally do and say don't fucking give me that shit you know and uh, so your way of of, 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 of rock star. When 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 you when you uh, sort of bolster in, in in those those contradictions in the film, which is really rich. Uh, yeah. No, I mean you couldn't hate him in the end because yeah. in in within it there is someone very lovable and vulnerable and 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 incredibly impressive, and you you can't just say you're an arsehole because that's not the whole story. It's part of the story. Yeah, well, just like Brendan Behan, that's what, like, I'm so glad you brought up Brendan Behan because I, in a sense, thought that, wow, he's he's taking this too far in the direction of Brendan Behan. Yeah, I mean, Behan was an early hero, you know, that first song they wrote is is from a Shane, uh, Flann O'Brien, you know, novel, Streams of Whiskey, is a, is a thing that happens in this novel, these streams of whiskey come up in a cave. Uh, but you know, it's it's a song written inspired by getting very involved with being. His parents knew being, I think. You know, um, so yeah, being I think was a, was a, and they dressed like Brendan Bean. They drank like Brendan Bean. Right. Uh, and Shane kind of wrote like Brendan Bean. Um, it, not exactly, obviously, but in that grand Irish tradition. I mean, yeah. Was his I mean, father still alive? Yeah, he is. I haven't heard otherwise. He's very old, ninety-two. Wow. Last when we when we interviewed him. It's it's such a great you know when when you're developing those uh, little little known aspects you know especially with I had no idea about Strummer's background until I read um, Chris Alowich's book and and then saw your film and do you feel that these guys want to protect those that secrecy the and want to just kind of hang on to the myth or did they obviously joe was gone but he actually started talking about that stuff but when you when 
you describe some of these people who are heroes to others. Do you feel a, a certain responsibility to, to the audience to find out as much as possible? Yeah, I think you want to be as loyal to the audience and to the subject, as you call them, subjects. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's the dynamic between both, really, that's interesting. Um, so you have to be very respectful of Shane's audience, and you know that they wouldn't want a whitewash version of him. Um, you know, they, they want <laughs> the, the whole deal, the warts and all, you know. Um, but on the other hand, you don't want to do a hat shit job on Shane McGowan, which is quite easy to do. Um, I mean, I've, you know, I do feel the film's quite harrowing at times, just looking at it and what he's done to himself. Mm. But on, the, you know, the next minute, he's blindingly funny, witty, um, alive, you know, so there's a strange kind of tension between, between something that is quite miserable. Um, I heard he said I'd made him look miserable. I, you know, I didn't make him look like that. <laughs> he made himself look like that. Um, and I tried to make him as fun as I could. You know, I think he's very funny. He's got an amazing sense of humor and timing and... Um... Did Victoria watch it? Did she... Yeah, I mean, I think she probably doesn't dislike it, you know, <laughs> but I think, you know, she's got to toe the, the party line probably. I mean, Shane, um, I didn't, go to the screening he we had a screening before we'd finished it but we were nearly kind of finished so we wanted to show it to him and ask for any you know comments and anything he, he would like to bring up you know and um i wasn't there um but one of our producers was there and jerry adams was there and victoria was there i think um we got a note from jerry saying he, he was blown away you know by a great and we got a message, well, the producer said that Shane was, he laughed a lot throughout, and there were moments where he was very, very strangely silent. And then he was in floods of tears at the end, so I, I don't know what that means. It's a beautiful um, film. You should, I, I mean, you should be proud of yourself. <laughs> yeah, but it is traumatic watching your life flash by like that, I'm sure, you know. Um, I'm glad I didn't, I wouldn't have done the film about Joe if he was alive, because he was a good friend of mine, a real yeah. friend, you know, uh, family growing up together and all that kind of thing. So that was, that was different. Um, Did you know his folks? Joe's? Um, his, his parents? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I was close to him for a moment in the punk time and then had 25 years of hatred. Uh, yeah. Well, not you know bad vibes because he was a middle class cut it takes one to know one you know but he <laughs> pretended he wasn't <laughs> uh, and, were, and his manager bernie rhodes you know said you can't film pistols and us you've got to choose you know so i said well fuck it i'll stick with the pistols um, i i still I, I still love that scene and this is why i think you're really funny is is when um uh topper is saying, I forgot what Bernie Rhodes called me, and then you cut to provincial tosser. You remember that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Oh, so, he's saying Mick Jones, middle class, right. working class, like Joe Strummer, maybe, but not for me. Right. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised no one's done a film about Bernie Rhodes. I'm sure he would love it. Oh, man. <clears throat> he's asked me. <laughs> I'm, I wouldn't go near, I mean, he's moved to the nearest little town in the middle of nowhere. Oh, wow. So we've got to do stuff together, you know, like having, he's, he's like, I'm the handsomest guy, father in the, in the playground. You, know? you might, you might have to up your, <laughs> uh, you might have to up your SSRIs or uh, whatever antidepressant and, and, and make a film about Bernie. Well, he, I mean, he, yeah, he, he must be 80 now as well. So he's, he's got kids at primary you know, in old school. Oh. I'm the, I'm the handsomest dad in the playground. And he invented <laughs> punk. Yeah. Well, Without me. But there you <laughs> right. Well, so, so I'm really, I'm glad that you talked to me. I, uh, as always, um, feel blessed to have been able to drive you around Chicago with Richard a few years ago. 
And, yeah. uh, and I, I couldn't wait to see this, but I, I really, um, I often go back and watch the Wilco film when I'm feeling depressed about something. And obviously I met, I became very good friends with Mo Armstrong because of, because of uh, the future is unwritten. So it's, right. it's, I've, I've, I've yielded very nice things from your films, including right. friendships. Right. Well, that's cool. Well, uh, Mo has been not well, has he? But I hear he's better now. He, he's, better. he's better, but you know, I, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you, you never know. He's had a reprieve. Good. All right, oh, my friend. Well, let's, let's, right. let's talk with your next film and, and, and you look good despite having long hair. It looks good. <laughs> Old hippie coming out. Yes, sir. Out. Yeah. All right, Julian. All right. See Take you care, later. buddy. Cheers, man. Bye. Bye-bye.